no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is But when we get in the way of God, when we say, God, I'm going to do it my way, we stop what God is doing inside of our lives. And God says, okay, you want to do it your way? Go ahead. How's that work out for you? I mean, think about it. You're sitting here and, and you're like, God, I, I want to do it my way. I want to do it my way. And he's like, okay, I'm a gentleman. I'll, I'll let you do it your way. But in the moment that you do it your way, you're going to find that you're running from my way. Isn't that how Jonah was? Jonah was like, God, you want me to preach to people that don't want to hear? <laughs> That's today, guys. Amen. You want me to preach to people that, that don't want to hear the gospel? You want me to preach to people that are not willing to listen to your voice? You want me to do what? And Jonah said, oh, God, I got a better idea. How about, how about I go on a ship and I sail 2,000 miles out the way? And then we talk about it later and you, you rethink what you're thinking because there ain't no way I'm going to Nineveh. So he sailed 2,000 miles out of the way to Tarshish and God shipwrecked the boat. Amen. He allowed the storm to come. Amen. And, and, and when the, and listen, and look at your neighbor and say, this ain't even part of the message. It's just the introduction. Amen. Whew. Hallelujah. But he shipwrecked the boat. And when he shipwrecked the boat, come on, when waves was going over the boat, the boat was about to be lost. It didn't necessarily crash, but it was getting ready to. It was about to be lost, and when it was about to be lost, God said, okay, are you willing to do it my way now? Are you willing to do it my way now? Are you willing to do it my way now? And that's exactly what Charlie was saying. Are we willing to do it God's way, or are we going to keep doing it our way? Because the harder that we do it our way, can I tell you, if you run eight miles out of the direction, you've got to walk eight miles back. Eight miles in the woods, eight miles out the woods. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. And so getting to where you used to be on fire sometimes means, especially because here's the thing. If you take, if you take gold and gold and you have to get the impurities out of it, but let's say you take gold and you run it through the mud and you, you put it in all these different places where it wasn't supposed to be and it's still pure gold and it's still worth money, but you got to burn that gold down and get all the junk out of its life for it to realize its value and for everybody else to realize the value of the gold and so in that same process God is putting us underneath the fire and he's putting us on the saving pot and he's scooping off the dross and getting out the dirt and he's taking away the things that we think matters and he's saying okay do it your way but you'll never see your value that's why people when they look in the mirror they stay depressed they're so caught up with anxiety that they're choked up. They can't do anything but, but think about what they're going through. And God said, mm -mm. let me tell you something, child. If you've seen how much worth that you had, you are my workmanship created in my son, Jesus. And I don't create junk, says the Lord. He don't create trash. He sees every person. He sees the sinner closest to hell. Brother Charlie said it earlier. He said, there ain't anybody in this building that sinned more than I've sinned. Amen. I, now, I'll tell you, I sinned a lot, Charlie, but I'm believing you. Amen. God could have saved Adolf Hitler. God could have saved Charles Manson. The Apostle Paul was a murderer, and God called him to be a preacher. God can save anybody. Does God save everybody? No. God only saves the people who are willing to say, you know what, save me. It reminds me of the little boy who was, who was at, a, at a hurricane and the house was, was getting filled up with water and his dad was there and the little boy went on the boat but his dad stayed behind. He said, son, I got faith. God's going to save me. All of a sudden, a guy came on a trolley boat put, 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 putting around going through and, and, the, and, and the, the, man, the man was just sitting there. On, by that time, the water was raising up to, up to the windows and he said, hey, sir, get in. I'll save you. I'll get you out of here. He said, no, listen, man, God's going to save me. He's going to take care of me. I don't need your boat. Holy Spirit, come on in. The door just swung open. Hallelujah. Woo! Hey! Yeah, look. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. Hey! Either that or the devil walked out. Come on, can I get a witness this morning? Amen. He's like, I can't touch that. And so he said, oh, man, now, now they're really getting it. Woo. And the very, the very next person came by on a bigger boat. 
And by this time, he, he's crawled out the window and he's, he's made his way up to the top of the roof. And he's standing there and he's saying, Lord, please save me. Lord, please save me. And this big old man comes on a boat. And he's like, hey, get in. He's like, man, I'm waiting for God to save me. I think y'all know where I'm going right now. But he said, I'm waiting on God to save me. He said, okay, see, are you sure? Yeah, I got a, I got a rope. Come on in, you sure? No, nah, man, I don't need you. I'm waiting on God to save me. I got to hold off, Lord, I know. Man, the very next time a helicopter, that's my imitation of a helicopter, but nonetheless wasn't good. That's why I'm not a sound director at, at Hollywood, hallelujah. Helicopter comes by. We're here. Climb up the rope. We'll save you. I'm waiting on God to save me. And he died. And he went to heaven because he trusted God. But when he got to heaven, he asked God, God, why didn't you save me? He said, I sent two boats and a helicopter. What else you want? <laughs> Amen. Come on, somebody. And... And in that same way, in that same way, sometimes we're like, well, I'm waiting on the Lord to convict me before I lay that down, before I lay my cigarettes down, before I wait, wait, lay my weed down, before I quit cussing, before I quit smoking, before I quit cheating, before I quit, you know, having things before marriage and everything else. I, I, I'm waiting on God to tell me it's wrong. Well, it's right here, guys. There was a, there was a sheep. had headphones on. I've seen this little cartoon. He had headphones on and a, and a, and a, and a, and a newspaper in front of him. And, he, and there was a little caption that said, I wish God would talk to me. And there was a big hand handing down a Bible. He was too distracted. Too many people have their face in Facebook instead of their face in God's book. Come on, can I get a witness this morning? And, and so... Can I tell you, when the, preacher, when the preacher talks about sin, when the preacher talks about things that are wrong, it's your job and your, your right to understand, hey, the preacher is talking to me. Every one of you. Amen. I can look at all of you and I'll take five seconds and I'll do that. Because we all got issues. I have issues. You stay with me, you'll see. I have issues. But I trust in a God that who does not have issues. I trust in a God who can take care of everything that I'm going through. I trust in a God who is realer than my right hand, who can change me from the back to the front, whose grace is so sufficient that in, in my weakness, my strength is made perfect in my weakness because my strength does not rely upon the strength of men, but in the heart of God. And in the strength of God. And the Bible says not by power, not by mate, not by strength, not by might, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. And can I tell you this morning, my God, my God, hallelujah, God is moving his Holy Spirit inside of this place. People are about to be changed. Lives are about to be set free. And I want to deal with an issue that most pastors steer away from. I want to deal with an issue that, that, because everybody likes to talk about drugs, and everybody likes to talk about sex, and everybody likes to talk about pornography and all these different things but let me tell you one of the roots of the problem inside of people's lives is their mouth look at your neighbor say watch it now look at your neighbor say sometimes you need to shut it Woohoo! yeah that one's tough don't look at your wife and say that men look straight ahead you're attentive if you weren't you are now look straight ahead <laughs> blinders no one preached to you hallelujah <laughs> your wife's not here yet so look at both ways before you cross the street amen hallelujah Woo! i want to i want to talk to you this morning about your mouth and if I was to give a, a, a title to the sermon, it would literally be Watch Your Mouth. But since I don't title sermons and I don't preach sermons for babies and bassinets that have not enough power to blow smoke off their cigarettes, that we're coming in here with more anointing than, than what you are normally used to seeing unless you come here every Sunday, hallelujah, because we believe that the power of God is not just supposed to be there to make people get cold chills, but we believe that the power of God is supposed to be there to change people's lives from glory to glory to faith to faith, that the man that you was when you came in here three years ago two years ago two weeks ago or even today will not be the same man that you are when you leave out of here hallelujah will not be the same woman that you are when you leave out of here hallelujah so we believe the word of god can change people but the word of god will never change 
Isn't it amazing that something that never changes can change us, amen? Many a times we ask God to change the storm, but God said, I sent the storm to change you, amen? And it's, it's not, it's a, God will allow, God will allow you to have trials and he will allow temptation. You better believe, just like Charlie was saying, the Bible says that God led Jesus up to be tempted. But can I tell you, the temptation didn't come from God, it came from the devil. But God still allowed it, amen? And some of y'all are going through things this morning that God is still allowing to see where you're at with your walk. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of James. Brother James, I've been preaching there a lot. James, I think this is your book. There ain't a book of Jason, but my name's mentioned a couple times in the Bible. Hallelujah. I want to just give you something for free. This has absolutely nothing to do with anything I'm preaching this morning. And I very well might be chasing a scroll here, but this is just really cool knowledge, okay? How many of y'all knew there's a book in the Bible called Isaiah? Raise your hand. How many chapters are in the book of Isaiah? 66. This is just something interesting that I wanted to share with you because God put it in my spirit to share with you. Did you know the book of Isaiah is a miniature Bible? How many books are in the Bible? 66. The 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah is about Old Testament law and the wrath of God. There's 39 chapters in the Old Testament. 27 chapters in the book of Isaiah, are about God's new covenant and his grace and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are 27 chapters in the New Testament. Amen? So these, there are 20, 27 books, not chapters. 27 books in the New Testament. The book of Isaiah is a miniature Bible. That's just a fun fact. Look at your neighbor say that was for free. Yeah. All right. So nonetheless, I had to get that off my chest. Amen? Did y'all know before I get started that I literally chased a squirrel last week? Yeah, literally chased a squirrel last week. So I rode up into the schoolhouse, right? And about a week prior, Charlie goes up to this air duct, and Charlie's digging out the air duct, and he's like, I was like, man, that must be a rat's nest. You know, I, th I think it's a squirrel's nest, Bubba, is what he said. I was like, okay, well, hopefully those things don't come back because they're going to be mad that you stole their home, amen? And so my, I told my wife, I was like, hey, man, you haven't seen what, what's been done to the nursery yet and the cool things that are going on. You need to come in. So we walk up in there, and it's kind of dark, and it's kind of fuzzy, and I'm like, you know, it's already creepy anyway because it's, it's completely dark through there, hallelujah, till you get the light switch. And so I'm walking down the hall, and I see something scurry out the left corner of my eye, and I about lost it. I'm telling you, I just about lost it. And I said, hey, it's a squirrel. <laughs> and to my surprise, this preacher chased that thing. Amen. <laughs> hey, hallelujah. I, I was running down the hallway. I said, I'm going to get that thing to the first door that's open. And I was like, whoo, whoo, whoo. I was puffing like a kid that had asthma, hallelujah, or, or a big guy running after cake. Can I get a witness? And as, as, I was, as I was running, this squirrel went into the last room on the left, which happened to be the children's room, and it just about bit me and tore me up. But I grabbed that thing, and I chased that thing, and after about 45 minutes, I got it out the house. Can I get a witness? Hallelujah. So for a moment, I just wanted y'all to know I chased a squirrel. That was funny. Now you're able to focus. Okay. So for any of y'all that feel bad for chasing squirrels, just know that I've done it first. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. If you have your Bible, what's that? Squirrel cheesing's not in. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's why I let him go. He would have been tasty. Hallelujah. Little tree rat. But nonetheless, James chapter three, when you get there, shout Amen. Come on, when you get there, shout amen. amen. Woo, that was good. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that you shall receive greater condemnation. In other words, you can't serve the Lord and serve the devil at the same time. Can I get a witness? For in many things we are all offended. If any man is not offended in word, the same is a perfect man. So here's the thing. You got to watch what you say and not worry about what everybody else says. Amen. It's so easy for us to get offended at what our neighbor says about us. Can I tell you, it's easy for me if somebody starts bad mouthing God or bad mouthing redeeming mean grace for me to give them a piece of my mind hallelujah but i need to give them a piece of god's mind amen i need to tell them that listen you sinning you better knock it off 
He says, but this man is a perfect man who's able to brittle his whole body because he can control his mouth. Hallelujah. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn them their whole body round about. Behold, with ships, which though they are great, they're huge, they're heavy, they're monstrous, they're gigantic. I mean, think about the Titanic. That big boat was turned with such a small helm. Think about your car. Think about your trucks. This big machine is turned with just something so small, your hands move it. And so he says here, mm, hallelujah. He says to us, he says, they're driven by the fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whatsoever the governor listeth. Even so, the tongue, a little member, somebody underline the tongue, highlight it, the little member, amen, boast great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindles. Can I tell you, in the 1800s, one of the biggest fires that ever broke out, broke out in Chicago. And the fire, I'm not talking about a fire of God. I'm talking about there was this forest fire that broke out in Chicago and 1,500 people died. It was 85% of the population at that time was killed because of a fire that started from a brush burning. And the wind chased it around. Hold that thought, okay? The Bible says that the tongue, verse 6, is a fire, a world of iniquity. So the tongue is among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. It is set on fire of hell. Can I, can I get a witness this morning that our tongue can produce fires? Amen. For every kind of beast, any birds of the serpent or the serpents, things in the sea is tamed. And he has been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. Write that down, underline, no man can tame it. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therefore we bless God, even the Father, therewith we curse men which are made in the likeness of God, or the similitude. Similitude means simile or like, right? In the likeness of God. Out of the mouth, out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. And Paul, or, or James says... These things, brethren, ought not to be so. Does a fountain send forth the same place sweet water and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, berries, either a vine of figs? So no fountain can both yield salt water and fresh water. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit, God, that's getting ready to move in such a mighty way this morning, God. I thank you for your power that surpasses all understanding, God. I pray that you make a way when there seems to be none, God. I pray that everybody that's listening under the sound of my voice this morning, God, that they get a dose of the Holy Ghost this morning, Lord, that they would learn to allow you to tame their tongue, God. I pray that they'd learn to allow you to talk in their life, God. I pray that they learn to allow you to get on fire, God. I pray that they learn to allow themselves to get on fire for you, God. I pray that you'd open up the windows of heaven, God, and pour out your spirit among them and so much that they have not room to receive it. So they pour your Holy Ghost on their neighbors and their neighbors' neighbors, on their family and their families' families, God, from their grandchildren to their great-grandchildren to their children's children and so forth, God, to their aunties, uncles, brothers, sisters, mothers, cousins. Luke, I am your father, God. Lord, help them in the name of Jesus, God. Help them to grow close to you, Father God. Help them to grow close in your grace, God, and help us to bring forth in your mercy. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. and amen. I'm just going to take a moment. Mm. Hallelujah. I'm about to speak on watching your mouth. Let it set in. God gave me so much notes last night. I was, I was writing down notes at, at like 10 o'clock at night, and I woke up at 5.30 in the morning, and I prayed, and I, I kept writing down notes from 5.30 till about 7 a.m., 8.30, something like that. God was still giving me notes on this. I believe God wants you to understand why you need to watch your mouth. And it doesn't matter if you are, if you are 13 years old or if you are 80 years old. At the end of the day, we all have to watch what we say. We might not have cuss words coming out of our mouth, but we might be destroying what God is trying to bless. Amen. And so let's go forward here. Hallelujah. 
we, we just read how, how the, the fire of the tongue, it, it, it creates a, a little fire. It, it creates a little fire. But when you throw, what happens when you throw paper on top of a fire? Like that. What happens when you throw cardboard on top of that paper? What happens then when you start stacking twigs on top of that paper? What happens when, can it, can it eventually engulf full-size trees and full-size logs and everything else around it? So what happens, brothers and sisters, as we get into our lives and when we get offended by what somebody says and then we go. How much fire does it talk? How much fire does it touch? Can I tell you, brothers and sisters, I have no friends when I get in this pulpit. Amen. If I'm preaching on your sin, I'm preaching on your sin. Amen. If I'm preaching on my sin, I'm preaching on my sin. We all have problems. We all have issues. Amen. You might say, I submit to you today that no man can tame his tongue. And you might say, well, why in the world are you preaching about taming the tongue if no man can tame the tongue? Doesn't the Bible say no man can tame the tongue? Come on, girl. Oh, you're going to preach this message or I am. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So no man can tame that tongue. Get out of my way. Devil trying to trip me up. Amen. No man can tame that tongue, but who can? God can tame your tongue. Man, I don't want to miss this. So I'm going to stick here for a moment because God gave me some notes that was just, just hit my heart. So I say to you, why should I preach a message on watching your mouth if no man can tame his tongue? Come on, somebody. We got to get deep. The Bible says a tree that's planted by the rivers of water will grow deep. And whatsoever it does will prosper, amen. But see, when you're, when you're by God, when you're by God's grace, when you're by his mercy, you grow. When you're alone and you're walking away from the plan of God and you're destroying the crops of God, then you're, you're a tree that's planted in the desert. You won't grow, you won't flourish, amen. I know somebody, come on, that can tame your tongue. Come on, somebody. I know somebody that can tame your tongue. God can tame your tongue. The Bible says that I have made the tongue. Hallelujah. In the book of, in the book of Psalms, David said, my tongue is a pen of a ready writer. It is writing on the tablets of people's hearts. In Psalms 45.10 or 45.1, he says, my tongue is a pen of a ready writer. The one thing David did not say is my tongue is a pencil. Because you can't erase what you say. I've been guilty of it, haven't I? Amen. I've been guilty of saying some things, not trusting people. You know why? Because people have given me reasons not to trust them. Have you ever been guilty of that? You ever been guilty of giving people a reason not to trust you? You tell them, say, and you say, man, this stays between us. Next thing you know, the entire town knows your business. That doesn't feel good, does it? Doesn't feel good at all. Doesn't feel good to go down to Family Dollar and hear somebody talking about redeeming grace. Unless they're talking about the goodness of God. Now listen, people will lie and they'll talk all manner of everything about us. I've heard people say nonsense like we're a cult and this and this. And I, I just know that the devil is working through them and I pray for them that they would get saved because they're not. You can't be truly saved and coming against people of God and living, living like hell every day of the week. Amen. The Bible says that David said, my tongue is a pen of a ready writer. It's writing on the tablet of my heart. Amen. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but, but I, I want my words to bless God. I want my life to bless God. I want my actions to bless God. I want to get so close to Jesus that when a mosquito in the summertime bites J. Boggs, that thing flies away singing, there's power in the blood. I want to get that close. I want to get that close to God. I want the power of God to flow upon me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. But how can God anoint my mouth when the devil's cursing it? And when I'm cursing it myself. Not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday, but on every day of our lives, we should want to bless the Lord. I went to sing a song, the last song I was going to sing, and the Lord switched it up. Somebody say, the Lord can switch things, amen. One of the songs I was going to sing was bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship his holy name. Amen. Psalms 103 says, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Forget not his benefits. He is the God who heals you. Amen. You know what you should be doing instead of running your mouth is lifting your praise up to the one who can save your mouth. Lifting your praise up to the one who can change your mouth. Lifting your praise up to the one who can change your soul. One of the first things God ever did with me when I got saved is he took the cussing right out of my mouth. I believe if you're still saying the F words and you're still saying the B words and you're still saying all of that, you're still a child. 
And you need to grow up. Pull up your, put on your big boy panties. Come on, somebody. Can I get a witness? Amen. I'll say it how it is. You need to put your pants on. If you're staying at this and forget that or even talking that nonsense, you're not where you need to be with God. And God's saying you need to change your life. And you say, how in the heavens can I change my life? How can I stop my tongue? Every word, I flavor it with this and with that and F this and forget that. Man, that was me. When I first got saved, the first thing God did with me is he changed my life. He changed my mouth. Because he said, Jason, how can you be a preacher and bless people when you talk like a heathen and curse people? And so the first thing God will get with you is your mouth. You know why? Because your mouth proves you're saved. How do you know that? The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, in verse 9, he says, if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Many people say, well, that's just, that's just a, I said a prayer at the altar. Listen, the Bible doesn't say, say a prayer at the altar and you get saved. The Bible says, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, that God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved for all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Amen? So it is with our mouth that we find salvation through the grace and mercy of the cross. Hallelujah. It is with our mouth that we also find persecution from the enemy and from the devil. But sometimes many people say, the devil made me do it, Pastor Jason. I didn't know what I was doing, but can I submit to you this morning? The devil can't make you do anything. Can I submit to you this morning? You're lying. The devil might have tempted you. The devil might have put that temptation on you. You might be calling your wife the devil. You might be calling your husband the devil. But can I get a witness, ladies and gentlemen, that it was you that put your hand to the plow. And it was you that put the lighter to the fire. And it was you that put the logs on the fire. And it was you that continued to do what God said not to do. But people like to make every excuse like Adam and Eve in the, in the day of the garden. Adam and Eve came up and, and the serpent slithered its way in. You know, just many, many of weeks or months before when God created Adam and Eve, he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. Subdue from who? Subdue from the devil. He warned them, you better take control of your household. I'm going to tell you right now, children that are cussing their parents need their teeth knocked down their throat. Amen or ouch. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you right now, my grandma would have never let me cuss her. Amen. And these kids that are sitting there, I tell my kids, I tell them flat out, you think you're going to cuss me? You're going to get your hind end whipped or you're going to stand in the corner upside down for 10 hours? Amen. Parents, parents are like, oh, that's child abuse. That's this, that's that. Let me tell you something. The Bible says spirit of rod spoiled a child. Do we live by the Bible or do we live by the world? I'm not saying beat your kid. You shouldn't beat your kid. But when your kid's running its mouth, you need to discipline your child. You need to tell your child what they need to do. Need to be the father God has called you to be. Need to be the mother God has called you to be. Because when they get out of this world and they're not under daddy's roof or they're not under mama's roof, what happens when they end up in hell? It's your fault. Their blood is on your hands. And we need to teach our children to love God. And we can only do that not by shoving a Bible down their throat saying, open up, here you go. Because a family that prays together. So how do we teach our children about the love of God? We become the love of God to our children, amen? When, when our children are sick, we're down by their side and we're saying, honey, I'm right here. I'm praying for you. God's got a purpose for your life. This is not the end. This is only the beginning. This too shall pass. We teach our children the right way, and we bring them up in the admonition and the following of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of the prophet Isaiah, who in the sixth chapter, he said, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And when he seen God, and when he seen God's power, he said, woe is me, because I'm a man that's been cussing all of my life. The first thing that the Lord did when God convicted Isaiah was he convicted his mouth. I want to tell you that's the last thing many Christians want to change. They want to say, bless God, we love you, and stab you in the back on, on Tuesday. But on Sunday, they was nice. Actually, actually, come on, somebody. It's by Sunday night because they only made it to one service. Can I get a witness? Hallelujah. Amen. Because they, they knew that they had to creep and crawl to get out of there. Hallelujah. I, I'm going to tell you, there's people that are pillars of the church, and there's people that are caterpillars of the church. The pillars of the church hold the place up. The caterpillars crawl in and out every Sunday. Can I get a witness this morning that... God is trying to do something, but he's asking you to do something for him. And so the first thing that God dealt with with Isaiah was his stinking thinking in his mouth. 
Come on. Come on. And God's saying, shut your mouth. And that's not a cuss word. That means shut your mouth. Let me break it down in, in hillbilly language. Shut your mouth. Amen? Amen? You know, if you can't say it to your mama, you shouldn't say it to your brother. If you wouldn't say it with Jesus in the room, you shouldn't say it when he's not because he's always present if you're saved. You know, the Bible says two or three gathered in his name. There he is in the midst, and Christians work off of that. But can I tell you, something changed after Jesus said that. You know what changed? The Holy Spirit got sent down to planet Earth to dwell inside of people because the Holy Ghost had fulfilled the mission after he went inside of Mary. She, Mary was the first woman. Hallelujah. Mary and, and, and John. Hallelujah. Mary and John was the first two ladies that received the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit inside of them. The Holy Spirit came to dwell inside of them and change their life. You think about last Sunday night, I preached about Samson, and, and God said, woman, you're about to raise a godly son. He's going to be a Nazarite. He's going to deliver his people from all sorts of types of hell and things like that. But you need to step up to the plate. I'm looking at some parents, I'm looking at some brothers, I'm looking at some sisters, I'm looking at some people that need to step up to the plate. Can I tell you in baseball, if a pitcher can't throw a ball across the plate, they don't lower the plate to, to say, it's okay, Johnny, we'll just make the plate 25 inches or, or 32 inches. Matter of fact, we'll make it 45 inches, then you can throw the ball across the plate. They say, know what? You ain't meant to be a pitcher if you can't throw the ball across the plate. And I want to say today, if you can't get with the program, you need to get back to the altar. Come on, can I get a witness? Hallelujah. And so, oh, my God, hallelujah. Man, that preaches. I don't care who you are, amen. Got excited. You know, when I first got saved, the first thing that, that God did inside of my life was he, he changed my mouth. You're a witness. Every word that came out of my mouth was F this, forget that. And if someone ran their mouth, it wasn't just someone running their mouth. I'd kill them. Wouldn't think twice about it. But God saved my life. He took that anger out of my soul. He took the words right out of my mouth, and it wasn't while he was kissing me. Amen. Come on. Can I get a witness this morning? Hallelujah. He was breathing on my life. Some of y'all didn't get that. Y'all might not be old enough yet, or maybe you, maybe you just passed by that song. But nonetheless, God breathed in my life, and he changed me, and he rearranged me. And he said, Jason, I've called you to be the man I've called you to be. Now be the man I called you to be. And I want to say to you today, be the man God called you to be. I want to say to you today, be the woman God called you to be. I want to say today, be the parents God called you to be. I want to say today, if, you're, if, you're, if your children have children and your children are not helping their children, be the grandparent God has called you to be. Be the great grandparent God has called you to be. I want to say, and if you are, praise God for that. Give Jesus a hand clap, amen. If you're already doing what I'm telling you to do, praise God for that. Take this message and give it to somebody else. Help somebody else out because at the end of the day, we need each other to be who God has called us to be. It's kind of like the man with the story in the boat. There was people that God had put in his life to get him the rescue that he needed. God still was saving him, but God used somebody else to have the rescue. Amen. And I want to tell you today, there's a man named Jason Boggs who, who God sent on, on October 22nd of 2012 to Brandywine, West Virginia. It was snowing that day, spitting snow worse than it is now. And God said, Jason, I want you to leave all that you have behind. You got a pregnant wife. Oh my goodness. Hallelujah. You got a $300 car payment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to quit your job. I want you to stand on faith and I want you to preach the gospel in West Virginia. I said, okay, Lord, here I am. Send me. Hallelujah. In the last year since 2012, I've seen the glory of God move like I've never seen it before. But you know, God wouldn't have moved in me if I hadn't moved my life and changed who God had called me to be. Amen. And I want to tell you today, you have a purpose inside of your life, but you might miss it. The Bible says many are called, but very few are chosen. I don't want to miss the purpose of God. There was a man that was waiting for Jesus to be born, and God said, if you are faithful, you will see my promise fulfilled. Amen. And the Bible says that priest dedicated Jesus at the temple on the eighth day. Hallelujah. Glory be to God, because he stayed faithful to God, and God stayed faithful to him. But I think had that man had not been faithful to the call of God, had that man not been faithful to the word of God, had that man not been faithful to the prayer of God, I wonder if he would have ever seen the hand of God. 
I want you to know why many of churches throughout Pendleton County, and you better mark my word on this, if you don't believe me, you show up at their doors, a suit and tie type of guy, and there ain't nothing wrong with that, but when somebody looks down on you because the apparel that you're dressed in or not dressed in, they need to get to the altar, hallelujah. They need to be, come on somebody. I'm a tattooed preacher. I'm a three-time felon by 15 years old, and God saved my life. And if God can take a sinner like me and make him a saint, my God, he could do anything. There's churches that don't have enough anointing or any power to blow, blow puff off of a, a peanut, hallelujah, blow fuzz off of a peanut, blow fuzz off of a lima bean. They don't have any power. When you walk up in them, it's just as dead as a doornail. Somebody's afraid to raise their hand, say hallelujah, a little shop they shop they. The preacher says amen, and they all go home at the crack of 12 o'clock, maybe 1230 if there's a dinner afterwards, amen. And they talk good about everybody, say hello, brother. But by the time they leave the door, they're already bad-mouthing how they didn't agree with what the pastor was saying and all these different things and spreading rumors and spreading gossip. Can I tell you this county's full of them? False pastors, false preachers, false churches, churches that are that are that are in it not to win it. Amen. Let me tell you something. If you ain't seen someone saved in years, you're doing something wrong. Get a new pastor. Come on, somebody. Amen. Come on, somebody. Come on. If your if your church isn't on fire, get to one that is. Hallelujah. Because you can't be on fire. When they're putting extinguisher on your fire. God's time is short and, 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 and it's never been long. But eternity is longer than you'll ever think. And Jesus is coming back. Jesus said in the book of Matthew to the Pharisees, they were a generation of vipers. In other words, he called them a son of snakes. Can I tell you, it's not wrong to say what is wrong. It's not wrong to call sin, sin. It's not wrong to say homosexuality is a sin. It's not wrong to say that God only made one genders, uh, a male and female, and that's it. There's no in-between. You can't be a he-male, a she-male, or anything else male. Hallelujah. The Bible says the truth. And I don't care if, you, if your brother is gay. I don't care if your sister is gay. God says, love the sinner, hate the sin. The Bible still calls sin, sin. And you can't coddle them and you can't rub, you can't coddle them and say, they're there, it's okay. No, because what's going to happen? You're going to send them to hell by not giving them the truth. And too many preachers are afraid of their congregation up and leaving. Jesus one day preached to thousands of people and the disciples were the only ones that were left. There was 12 standing around and he turned around and he was like, you going to leave too? I ain't in it for a, for a, for a, a church that's going to be packed from front to back, but I'm going to tell you it's going to happen because people are hungry for the truth, amen? People are hungry for a pastor that will tell them what they need to hear instead of what they want to hear all the time. Oh, you're okay. You're doing fine, but they don't realize that their marriage is getting ready to split, and every time that they go to bed at night, they sleep in separate rooms. They don't realize that there's things going on, and they just want to walk away, and there's times when they wake up in the morning that they don't have any. They need deliverance because they're they're so stuck in depression and they're so stuck in anxiety that all they want to do is crawl into a hole. But people are hungry for a pastor that will help them get out of that mess and give them a message that they can come up out from above all that nonsense. I'm good, or he can say, I'm blessed. When you realize that the hand of God has blessed you, you start speaking that into existence. The blessing of God comes upon your life. When you say, I'm having a bad day, guess what? You're going to have a worse day. Can I get a witness? Amen. Can I tell you, this is not your day. Look at your neighbor. Tap him on the shoulder. Say, hey. hey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, it's not your day. It's not your day. The Bible says this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. I will be glad and I will rejoice in it. So he didn't say I'll be sour as a sour puss. He didn't say I'll be, oh, bother, like Winnie the Pooh. He didn't say I'll be old or just, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, bother. Oh, Winnie. <laughs> Y'all need to be like Tigger because the wonderful thing about Tiggers is Tiggers are really fun. Hallelujah. Amen. The wonderful thing about Christians are really fun. And if you are a sour Christian, the chances are you're not one. Hallelujah. Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness in, the, in this building? Because here's the thing. When Jesus saved me, he put a fire in my soul that not a fire fire could extinguish it if it came forward to do it. Put a fire in my soul so hot that I chase hell with a water pistol, amen? I'm going to tell you flat out. Man, That's I'm going to tell you, God put a fire in my soul that was so hot it would make a mother-in-law's kiss never feel cold. Can I get a witness? God put a fire in my soul. He put it in my bones that it cannot shut up because what happened is God 
replace my word with thy word. And I want you to know today, God can replace thy, thy word with thy word. Here's how it happens. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Therefore, what you put into your spirit comes out of your spirit. If you got cussing on your music, if you got cussing on your, on your radio, if you've got cussing on your television shows, you think, well, it's not a big deal. It's just television, yada, yada, yada. Let me tell you something. How many of y'all like water? Raise your hand. Who doesn't like water? Raise your hand. What do you like? Dr. Pepper. Hallelujah. Now, you gulp that stuff down. I know that. You buy it by the two liters and say, I got a 20 ounce. <laughs> so, you would drink Dr. Pepper any time of the day, right? What if I put a turd in it? Would you drink it? Say, where are you going here? Let me, I, I got to explain something. This is deep. You wouldn't, would you? Let's say. All right, I need somebody else. <laughs> RJ is the exception. Say, Pastor, where are you going to this? Don't hate me. I'm real, and y'all just need to be real. Come on, somebody. Can I get a witness? Yeah. You wouldn't drink it if mud was inside of it and caked inside of it, would you? You wouldn't drink water if there was, if there was feces in it, would you? What, what if it was just a little bit? So why do you expect from people to come to you for advice when you got trash inside of your living water? Amen. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What you put in is what you're going to get out. You know what the, the definition of insanity is? It's doing the same thing and expecting something different to occur. That's insane. God knew that. People were sacrificing animals, and he says, you know what? There's coming a time where they need something greater than just getting some cologne sprayed on their body because they're starting to stink. So they need a bath. <laughs> they need a shower. They, they need a dose of the Holy Ghost. So he did something different that God had never done before. Look at your neighbor say, he did something new. Jesus became sin who never sinned. That you and I might become righteousness when we had never been righteous. That we might become holy when we had never been good. Because the only thing good about me, church, is God. So Jesus came to planet earth to die for your sins and to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He washed you by the power of his blood. God saved you, sanctified you, and set you apart for such a time as this. And what he wants to do is he wants to show his goodness to everybody here. Brother, he wants to show it to me just like he wants to show it to you. Sister, he wants to show it to you just like he wants to show it to me. God wants his love to be so strong for every one of us. But how can we hold on to God and to his purpose when we're constantly putting things in that should not be there? And so, guys, it's as simple as this. Change what you do and you'll have a different outcome. I made a decision one day in a jail cell to give my heart to Jesus Christ. And everybody knew me, knew that I was a, a, a pistol-toting person. And if that they ran their mouth, they didn't double-cross me because I knew people. That knew people. That would leave you like you never knew people. But when I became to know Jesus... I ended up knowing people that knew people that would make you like you only knew one person. Can I get a witness? Amen. God wants to change you from the inside. He wants to make you a new creation like you've never been before, but like you could always be again. And so why is it important for us to monitor our mouth? The Bible tells us in the book of James, look at this. Let's, let's, I, I know we've, we've made it very far, and I know it's like 
getting close to 12 o'clock and y'all are getting hungry. Hallelujah. And I know y'all want to, I know y'all want to beat everybody to the buffet. It's all good. Fox is closed on Sundays. Amen. I know y'all trying to get the AGK. Don't play. Can I get a witness? <laughs> I'm going to start talking about spaghetti for the next 30 minutes and then we'll see who loves Jesus or not. <laughs> all right. But here in this scripture, <laughs> that's funny right there. James chapter 3. The Bible says in the 10th verse, James 3.10, look at this for me. He says, out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Can I ask you this morning, are they so? Are you praising God on Sunday and cussing your neighbor on Wednesday? Are you backbiting and talking about people? Brothers, if that's you, you need to go to the altar. Sisters, if that's you, you need to go to the altar. And you need to ask God, help me. And then the way that he helps you is through his word. So that just the same way that you understood that now it's wrong to do this, and it's better for you not to know than for you to ever know. So if you never want to know anything about sin, never come to church. Become the church and learn not to sin. That's powerful. The Bible says that these things ought not to be so. I want you to turn with me to, if you will, it's, it's in the New Testament, it's in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy. By the way, while you're turning to Deuteronomy chapter 30, I want to just tell you that we are in a series that God put me in on revealing the Old Testament. On Sunday nights, I've been, I've been talking about the revelation of the Old Testament, looking at it in a New Testament way. And uh, last Sunday night, if you didn't get the opportunity, go back and watch it online or Sunday night message. It's on how Samson is like Jesus. That was Wednesday. That was Wednesday. But we're continuing that. We're continuing that this Sunday night. Hallelujah. And we're going to be talking about how somebody else was just like Jesus. It's going to get powerful. But nonetheless, unless the Lord changes my message, go to, go to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. The Bible says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. Now, what does that mean if God is recording? You ever stepped into a, into a room and they're like, okay, by the way, this conversation is now being recorded for quality assurance, <laughs> training purposes. You know why that is? Because if you say that you are who you say you are and you promise to pay something and you don't, they're going to get you. And you know, in the same way, we as Christians, this is just a side note, we as Christians shouldn't rack up debt up to our eyeballs and promise to pay something that we cannot pay. And we should make all of our wrongs right. Because we want to be the Bible to people. Because you and I might be the only Bible that someone reads. It's powerful. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, I call heaven and I call earth to record this day against you. He said, I have set before you life. And I have also set before you death. He said, I've set before you blessing. And I've also set before you cursing. But he gives us a very powerful statement. He says, make a choice. Choose what so that you and your family may live, your seed. Choose what? With your mouth. We're going to finalize this up and summarize it, but let me explain something. How did God create planet Earth? He said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, 
let there be light. And there was light. Everything God did, God spoke about it. Everything God wants you to do, he wants you to speak it into existence. The day that the Holy Spirit told me that we would have a school, and I told y'all we would have it no later than February, people looked at me like I lost my marble, said, you didn't hear from Jesus. I said, you devil is a liar, shut your mouth. Amen. I rebuke people from the pulpit, matter of fact. <laughs> I, just, I did, bro. It was awesome. I said, that don't sound godly. Yeah, it does. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. The Bible tells us this. And God gave us everything that we spoke. Debt free. We don't, we don't have a loan on the school. $426,000 in one day, God gave it to us. When you learn to walk the way God wants you to walk, you can have whatever God wants you to have. Why wouldn't you walk the way God wants you to walk? Why wouldn't you talk the way God wants you to talk? Why do, you, why do we as people want to live in a mediocre life, having just enough to scrape by? Do you not know that God is good and he has good for you? So I ask you today, choose life. Choose to speak life upon your family, upon your friends, upon your job, wherever you go, whatever you do. This is not the end. This is only the beginning. We might be in the end of times, but the end of times just means an everlasting day coming. Even the end of times is never the end. Can I tell you, brothers and sisters, I've read the story and it doesn't end with, oh me, it ends with amen. It's going to be all right. You've got this. We've got this. But we've got to learn to watch our, come on, somebody. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Pastor Scott, come forward, brother. You know, in that chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, the first 14 verses, they all speak of all of the benefits. But at the same time, when it gets into that 15th verse, it starts speaking of the curses. We all want to think of the good things that can happen but we don't want to think of the things that will happen otherwise. So you have this chance. The 18th verse says, it's going to be recorded in heaven. In the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 23, it says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All doesn't mean just the women or just the men, just the children or just the adults. It's all. If there's anything, anyone here that needs Christ as their Savior, it's being recorded today. You're given that chance for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. And it says in the sixth chapter of Romans that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Fifth chapter of Romans tells us that God commended his love. In other words, he's loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. He said, commended on his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. If you're in any one of those places, maybe you're not 
saved, but you need maybe you're saved, but you're not living where you need to be. This altar is open right now. It says any that confess their sins that Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's in 1 John 1, 9, if I'm not mistaken. There is. <clears throat> Praise God. So if there's any that's needing Christ as a Savior or needing prayer of forgiveness, prayer for forgiveness or anything, the altar's open, and that's for you online as well. You can make your table that you're sitting at or the couch that you're sitting on, the coffee table in front of it. Pastor that can be Joe your altar for right people. now. You don't have to be in the building. It can be in your home. Charlie, Joe, if you mind praying with the people, please. Brother James. Jeremy. Brother Y'all James. Would. Give myself away. So you can use me. I give myself away. So you can use me. My life is not my own. And you, I belong. I give myself, I give myself to you. And life is not my own. To you, I belong. I give myself, give myself to you. I give myself away. So you can use me. If you want to give everything over to God this morning, maybe you've given your heart to Jesus, but maybe you've backslidden and you want to come back to the foot of the cross and say, God, I dedicate my life back to you. The altar's open and our prayer warriors are here to pray for you and to love on you and to share the love of God with you. Give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. For this life is not my own, in you I belong. I give myself, I give myself to you. When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply call. Longing just to bring you something that today is the day of salvation. We're not given. We're not given tomorrow, but it's given to you today. You may not have that chance. We may not make it through the night. You may not make it home. We don't know. 
You search much deeper within. I mean, we hope and pray that nothing happens, of course. But just so that you're aware, there's nothing given to us except the gift of salvation. And it says that's for now. It's all about you, Jesus. King of endless words, no one could express. How much you deserve And all we can call You all I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself is not what you have required. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. If you need prayer for anything, come forward this morning. That the bright and morning star 
room at the cross for you before we dismiss this morning is there anyone else who needs prayer
This altar is a place for everyone. Not just you, me, him. Everyone has a place at this altar. Every one of us have something in our life that is holding us back from Jesus. Whatever it be. It could be alcohol. It could be our mouth. But there is something holding us back. Now's the time to get rid of it. I had so much hold of me back. I smoked pot for 50 some years, drank a fifth liquor every day. But when this church opened up and I give myself to Jesus over there, I've been clean every minute of it. Don't even want it. Don't even want it. And I was like Jason. Jason knows how the F-bomb fly out of my mouth. I used to work with him. If I can count, I can count the minute, the times I said F word on one hand in all the years I've, since I've been saved. Because the Lord has got a purpose for all of us, and that is to be a disciple. One of my greatest things is to get, once I get out of this door, is to go to people's houses and talk to them about Jesus. And I was at a family the other day. And, you know, she asked me a question. She said, James, saved once, always saved? Well, I had to search on that one. And the Holy Spirit told me, no, you're not saved. You have a chance to be saved. God is always there for us. But we cannot be saved to denounce God and just forget about Him because it don't work that way. And mostly, if you have really been saved, really know that you've been saved by God, you won't leave Him. You will not leave Him. You will, he will be there. We might have our moments but we'll never leave him. So, you know, this 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 is one of these things where Jason talks about preachers. This is a preacher telling her daughter, saved once, saved always. How can you expect to be saved always when it's just like the seeds? You grow with that fire and you get planted among the thorns. You gear in power, power, then you get choked out. So I asked everyone if they got anything that they need to talk about with the Lord. This is the place, this is the time, because we might not make it out that door. God bless all of you, and I love all of you.
ready to dismiss I received a letter in the mail by a gentleman who was going through some rough times and in this card he wrote this dear pastor your church family on hard times and I'm ready though through my travels but just know that I am very faithful and godly now and that it is that alone that is keeping me together during this situation that I am going through right now that has been very challenging. I've been through many storms and the Lord has weathered them all. This person had lost a child, been married and been divorced, been addicted and been pushed out, been locked up and God set him free. I won't read all of it because it's confidential but he did say to the church family, he said from, from his heart, thank you for the gift that we blessed him with in Jesus' name. Amen. And it wasn't us, it was God. But that's, that's, that's how God is using redeeming grace in many different ways. A family that prays together, let's make it happen.